Hello, welcome to Hypatia stage. Our next session today will be delivered by Mr. Jonathan Porritt, uh, author of a few books, commentator, broadcaster, um, and he will talk to us today about collaborative and sustainable consumption. Please welcome Jonathan on stage. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, delighted to be here today and delighted to be so supporting Campus Party and shedding what I hope is a little bit of light on this controversial area about what I've called shopping the planet. So we're in the middle of the most exciting, astonishing, dynamic phase of consumption in human history. Every year, more people consume more in an increasingly wealthy global economy. One or two people are quite worried about what that means from a sustainability perspective, but not enough. And as yet, the whole notion about innovation for a sustainable world so that we can improve our quality of life and still hang on to the things that are really precious to us in terms of the environment and society, we haven't really done a very good job on that yet. So just a quick word about Forum. We work with a lot of different organizations around the world. We've been going since 1996. We have a lot of big projects to try and persuade companies to move faster towards a more sustainable world. And the reason I'm here today is because we do a lot of work with O2, Telefonica. We've been working with them, and my colleague Bill Ayers is here today. We've been working with them for a long time. And we've helped a lot, in particular, with the O2 blueprint, which is the kind of underpinning sustainability message for um, O2. There they are, top left-hand corner, just to reassure you, definitely there. Okay, so what I want to talk about really today is what is the role of ICT in enabling a more sustainable world, in actually making it possible for more people to enjoy a good life on a planet that is being sustainably managed. What is the role of ICT in that particular story? And I'm really just going to raise with you the idea that we might be right on the edge of this notion of a collaborative economy, where collaboration and sharing becomes as powerful a part of our economy as acquisition and ownership. If that's the case, this is a very critical turning point in the history of capitalism, because it would mean moving from an ownership-based model to a shared model, which is a very different story. I'm not going to spend very long on the challenges, because I'm sure you really all deep down know what these challenges are. Right now, we're in one of these extraordinary moments in industrial history where the price of commodities has been increasing rapidly since the turn of the century. This is a direct consequence of there being more people on the planet every year and more people getting richer every year. And as people get richer, they consume more. It's a very simple story, basically. Now, it's a good thing that more people are able to consume more because essentially it means that more people are out of poverty and not trapped in horrendous poverty. So this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's a very difficult thing for people to deal with in terms of managing the global economy. We call this the funnel of life. It's a very simple concept. Basically, the stuff that we depend on, resources, ecosystem services, water, soil, biodiversity, forests, all of that stuff, the whole of that resource base is being worn away, is being eaten up all the time. And in precisely the same time period, demand for those resources, whether it's food or raw materials or energy or minerals, whatever it might be, the demand increases every year. So our story is really, how do we stop hitting the wall here, which is what we're going to do if we carry on with business as usual, and how do we find some really smart way to take the whole of humankind, 7 billion today and 9 billion by 2050, through that funnel? How do we do that? And that is an innovation challenge. That's all about how we use the human genius to steer through this particular problem. You've got to put a polar bear in here somewhere, otherwise you won't feel it's a real presentation about sustainability. Oh, so here are the little polar bears. This is the bit you have to focus on, however. Six weeks ago now, for the first time ever in a place called Mauna Loa on Hawaii, the observatory there estimated the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere 
at 400 parts per million. That's the highest recorded level ever in our history. And they've been doing these recordings since just after the Second World War in the last century. So this is the direction we're going in. And every time the concentration of greenhouse gases increases in the atmosphere, it increases the warming effect. It increases the threat to human society. Again, not the time to talk through the whole story about just how threatening accelerating climate change is, but you get the message. It's not a good prospect. So, that's the bad news. Now, what have we got to throw against that? What are the resources available to us to begin to make a difference to that? And as you will all know very well here, two astonishing things are really happening at the moment. Firstly, the ubiquity of online access. More people connected for longer, more easily, in more parts of the world. How far away are we from a world in which everybody is connected all the time, anywhere in the world? Which is really what ubiquity means. Everywhere, all the time, for everything. Five years? You get different projections. Who knows? We're heading in this direction, where online access of that kind is not something just for the rich world. It's shared across the whole of humankind. At the same time, we have this extraordinary growth in processing power that we're all very familiar with now. It's one of the most influential, determining factors in the shape of industrial society over the last 30, 40 years. And it continues. We've not yet come to the point where people say Moore's law has gone. We've actually still got evidence that year on year, we're seeing the Moore's Law story continuing to roll out in our midst. So if you add that to that, we've essentially got what technologists and economists call a general purpose technology, which means you can start looking to change the entire base of the economy. Not just a new innovation here, a new product, a new technology, but you change the whole, the entire base of the global economy, a bit like the steam engine did in the 19th century. So this is a transformative effect, which is of a different scale, transforming economic and social infrastructures. OK, so we're already beginning to get our heads around this. Just to give you a couple of very quick examples, you will be very familiar with the way the pattern of consumption is changing today. It's already quite disruptive. It's already quite destabilizing for a lot of old companies that thought they could once command a place in the market and have suddenly discovered that they can't. So to give you a classic example of this, HMV completely failing to read what was likely to happen to the way people would access their music digitally, allowing iTunes, Spotify to come in and essentially take the market away from them. We're seeing more and more of that. From a sustainability point of view, not a bad thing, because HMV's model was, of course, quite material intensive. You made the CDs, you had a shop, you had a, something on the high street, you had a presence, you had to have a lot of energy to make all that happen. We've got a more dematerialized way now of enabling people to enjoy access to music. Slightly different example, Zipcar, one of the world's most dynamic, successful car sharing clubs, US-based, now beginning to widen out elsewhere in the world. Already established a very exciting model Lots of people were beginning to get involved in it. Avis looked at this and said, whoa, if they really grow as fast as they say they're going to grow, this could undercut the market for conventional hire car arrangements. So rather than wait around to be, as it were, knocked off track by this up and coming little thruster, as it were, we'll buy them. So they bought zip cars, and they're now developing zip cars in a way that they see as being complementary to their own business model. Now, I'm only talking about one part of this changing global economy today. I'm literally only talking about this bit here, collaborative consumption, the sharing economy. But what you need to remember is this is part of a much bigger thing going on. When O2 Telefonica thinks about what sustainability means in the future. It has to think about all of this stuff. What's the balance between the products we provide and the services we provide? How do we do this dematerialization? 
It's a very long word for a very simple idea, which is how do you reduce the amount of stuff you need to produce value in society? How do you take raw materials and energy out of the value chain and still have a product or a service to sell at the end of the day? How do you do that? How do you do all this stuff around efficient use of resources? Circular economy is a big idea. How do you stop waste leaking out of the system? This is now pretty much part and parcel of what every big company in the world is looking to for its sustainability answers, how we make this all add up. So, if you go back to the 1950s, the model of progress was essentially based on people getting access to better paid jobs, to improve their purchasing power, to buy more stuff, to improve their quality of life, and have a higher status in society. And in a funny kind of way, this kind of house represents what that looked like. You'd start small, and as you worked your way up the material ladder, you would buy bigger and better, and your whole sense of yourself in society would improve at the same time. This is still a very powerful model. Don't get me wrong. Re people really like to think that part of their success will be measured by the size of their house. Not just in the United States, not just in Europe, but increasingly in China. And if ever you go and visit Shanghai and you want to have a bit of a depressing experience, just drive outside the immediate city center and look at the number of suburbs outside Shanghai that are building monsters like that. But this is a bit of a subversive slide because what it's saying is maybe it's not exactly as you think any longer. People might still be buying the house, but maybe they're just renting it for a little bit to enjoy a bit of a time in it. Everything else may be, you can go and rent your lawnmower. Why buy a lawnmower if you're only using it sort of six days a year? What's the point? Why not go and rent it? And I'll come back to that. Maybe you don't really need to have a big loft to store everything. Just stick your storage, stick all the stuff you want in a storage company's loft. Get them to provide the space. Maybe a smart bag like this, which might cost you, I don't know, anybody know what a smart bag costs you? Not my territory, really. X thousand dollars. If you really want to show you've got sort of a sense of style and fashion and everything else, what's the point of having sitting it around, it sitting around most of the time? Why not just hire it for a day? Hundred dollars a party, whatever it might be. Pickup truck, bike, dog. That's weird. Anyway, the idea is that people might stop thinking about buying and acquiring and start thinking about renting and sharing. So this has led to the supposition, sometimes called the collaborative economy, that we're beginning to see as much emphasis on access as on ownership. So think about zip cars. Why would you want to buy a car if you can have access to a really smart car club? Why is this important? Because you need to just stare into the crystal ball a little and work out what is going to happen if we just keep on doing what we've done for the last 60 years. Okay? These are very simple growth projections in terms of spending by middle class consumers. This is spending patterns through to 2030. Interesting. So here is North America. Consumer spending in North America is estimated to grow from around $5.5 trillion to 5.6. There's not much growth left in the consumer markets in America. Compare that with what's going on elsewhere. This is Africa, considerable growth here. This is Central and South America. This is Europe, a little bit more growth. This is, of course, the huge, great powerhouse in the global economy today. Massive increases in consumption in India, China, Southeast Asia in general, Indonesia, Malaysia, all of these countries now growing all the time, aspiration growing all the time, purchasing power growing all the time, opportunity to live like people live in the rich world, growing all the time. This is essentially why we still have any growth in the global economy today. And you can see the extent of that, $4.9 trillion here, 32.9 in the Asia-Pacific area by 2030. Good thing? Yeah? Good thing at one level? Don't be mean about it. Lots of people here are really happy that they're able to consume 
and have a higher standard of living, material standard of living, than they had before. Why wouldn't they be? We all were when it came to Europe, America, elsewhere. But here's the problem. If we move towards not just 2 billion people consuming at our current level, but perhaps 5 billion people consuming with today's aspirations and today's expectations, we are in serious trouble. So this is the message sold all around the world that a Western lifestyle ought to be available to people from the perspective of justice and expectation and everything else. Now, you know the, the data and all this. We're already living beyond the means of the planet, beyond the one planet threshold that we ought to be living within. So this stuff, it's not possible. It's not going to work. So that's why we have to look to alternatives. So this is how we're now trying to model this. How do you get to the position where you can still look to a world in which people's material well-being is improving? We're still addressing poverty. Absolutely critical imperative for anybody interested in sustainability that you continue to address poverty. In China, 450 million people lifted up out of poverty over the last 25, 30 years. Easy to be pretty critical about China's pollution issues, but if you see it from the perspective of people in China, 450 people not living in utterly grinding poverty. Interesting trade-off. So what we know is we have to think about this radical shift. How do we meet people's needs in less resource-intensive ways, in ways that reduce the throughput of raw material in the economy, but still allow us to keep improving people's quality of life. Okay, so what are the opportunities here? Well, let's just have a little look at some of the bright, sharp startups that you will have heard something about. So Tocker, French company, sm for small French company under the big umbrella of Castorama in France, is essentially a place where young people can begin to share skills, can learn from each other, to provide skills for a certain purpose, whatever it might be, whether it's building something, whether it's music, whether it's more to do with a sort of wealth-creating opportunity, whether it's to do with recreation, IT, doesn't matter. Street Bank, very localized, simple web-based opportunity for people to share their lawn mowers, their power drills. I hope some of you are aware of the obscenity associated with the purchase of power drills in the Western world? Can anybody tell me what the average length of use is for a new, freshly minted power drill from B&Q, whatever it is? Average lifetime use, please. It's just more than six minutes. It's nine and a half minutes. Nine and a half minutes. Because you know what happens. People trog along, they think, oh my God, look at that power tool. I, I got to put up a shelf. So they buy a power tool and they take it back and they put up the bloody shelf, which probably falls down later anyway, but they put it up. They're really proud. They stick the power drill in the shed or the garage and somehow it's not quite so wonderful any longer. So we got a problem there. Landshare, new, very creative little company for people who want to grow stuff haven't got any land, might live at the top of a high-rise building, get in touch with people who've got a bit of surplus land, got a garden they don't want to use, which has been overtaken by wilderness, and they put the, the demand with the supply. O2 Recycle. I hope you're all familiar with O2 Recycle. Providing opportunities for high-quality, with warranty devices to be sold in Europe for second, third purposes, whatever it might be, reducing the churn of hardware of appliances, devices in the marketplace. So we're already here today. Now, just imagine if the old economy starts thinking about working harder with the new economy. So I mentioned to you Zipcars and Avis. Well, think about some more crazy link-ups. These don't exist, by the way. This is just the workings of Forum for the Futures over, overburdened brain power, okay? 
Just imagine that Airbnb, I imagine you all know what Airbnb is, one of the fastest growing, astonishing uh, little startups, providing rooms in people's houses for people who don't want to go and stay in. Very large, expensive hotels run by companies like Marriott. Now, what if Marriott was to say, God, this Airbnb thing is really extraordinary. It's definitely taking business away from us. But what if we get together with Airbnb and we sort of Marriott the Airbnb offer? We bring rooms in some people's homes up to a kind of Marriott standard. We provide some of the services. We look after all the facilities. Maybe we still drive them from the airport to their Airbnb, whatever it might be. What if we say, actually, this is so smart. Rather than waiting for Airbnb to take more and more of our marketplace, why don't we work out a model where we co-create some different kind of value? Fairphone. I hope you all know about Fairphone. It is an amazing story, Fairphone. It's a Dutch company that is producing ethical phones, ethical devices, tracked all the way back into the supply chain for every single component part of a basic phone kit. Tracking it all the way through, incredibly difficult to do, to get that kind of level of detail about what's going into a phone. It's really difficult to do. So far, Fairphone has sold 14,000. It's not bad, actually, considering it's still a startup, but it's pretty slow. So what if Fairphone said, OK, well, we'll put all our creativity into this and our ethics, because Fairphone is all about an ethical base to a business, and we'll marry up with one of these bigger companies, these kind of giants of the uh, IT world out there. We did a bit of work for Sony, where we helped create the idea of one device for life. So instead of having to change your device every year, 18 months, whatever it might be, you'd have one device, and then every time you want to change it, you change all the software. You change everything to do with what it got, the functionality, the service you got, but the kit, the bit of kit, would stay for as long as you liked it, and you'd love it, basically. So what if Sony created a fair one device for one life solution? What if Street Bank, which I've just talked about, got together with Street Club, which is a B&Q initiative, in B&Q stores where they're helping people use their skills to create answers to people's local needs. What if we saw a more creative mixing up of the old economy and the new economy? Okay, nearly done. So how can ICT really, really, really make a contribution to a more sustainable world? That's what we're talking about. There are hundreds of people here fascinated by the role of ICT. But if that fascination doesn't connect to the sustainability agenda, frankly, it's kind of missing the point. So how can ICT do this job? Well, we're already seeing this, providing information at the right time to enable people to enjoy a better quality of life. You look what's happening in transport systems around the world, access to that kind of information about reliability of services, frequency, what's happening, transformative effect. Secondly, creating these new platforms to encourage collaborative consumption. And thirdly, and let's not forget this, enabling people to campaign more effectively. We have no illusions about this in Forum for the Future. We want to create positive solutions to the world's problems, but they don't just happen of their own accord. You have to go out and make things happen. That's the part of the success behind Avaz. 38 degrees here in the UK is building these online, internet-based, digital campaigning platforms to change the minds of people whose minds still need changing. That's our challenge, if you like. Very simple. How are we going to do this as inventors, creators, people who enjoy and celebrate the genius of the human spirit? How do we get out and do this stuff more intelligently than we've done it up until now? How do we build these platforms? So this is the stuff. This is the thing that I'm looking for now. How do you leverage the power of ICT to change the systems on which the global economy depends? That's the story. And the scale of the change is absolutely bloody enormous for the reasons that I've already mapped out. So that's what we do. We work a lot with entrepreneurs, with innovators, with big companies, small companies in different parts of the world to get this sense of accelerated solutions really moving much faster than is currently the case. So thank you for listening to that. I hope it's been of interest, sufficiently provocative to persuade you to spend the next half an hour giving me a hard time, asking me questions, 
questioning my hypothesis that this is a doable thing, whatever it might be. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So, your questions, please. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hello. Uh, I'm William. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, one particular uh, piece that I'm interested in is how we change the behavior of big organizations, so uh, large enterprises, and particularly people who work in large enterprises. Um, and I think that I like your model of um, sort of an, an evolution, but I'm thinking about today yeah. and how, um, co how you see connectivity, uh, particularly with 4G coming along, changing the way that people actually work and what impact that's going to have on, say, for example, travel and consumption and the ability to do a better job using yep. less resources and whether there's any research around that that you're involved in. Yes, there is. There's a lot of research. In fact, the whole idea about what this kind of connectivity is going to mean for working patterns in general is a theme that's been looked at really quite rigorously over the last 15 years to see what the change in work patterns might look like. And in fact, um, O2 Telefonica is one of the companies that has pioneered the notion of how can we reduce our dependence on physical space, encourage our employees to work more from home, enjoy the opportunity to avoid travel as a consequence of that, but still have sufficient identity, sufficient involvement with everything going on inside the company to be as productive as they would be if they were in the company. And Bill will tell me what it is, but you've got a, quite a big percentage of your employees now who work at distance, and it's been a really interesting story over time. And a lot of companies have done that. Now, you're asking a different question, which is, can you push that to the nth degree? Can you actually think about dematerializing large corporations altogether? Well, I'm going to take it to the extreme, okay? So that, exactly, so that you sort of think, can we dispense with big, high prestige headquarters buildings altogether? And where we're running a set of much lower impact, decentralized business hubs, so that people can get access to technology support, can still feel part of a community, but they don't have to do this story of commuting every day, whatever it might be. Now, the evidence actually is really interesting here, because people still like to have the idea that they are connected via a physical base. It's not, if you're completely virtual, if there's no sense of the community of people working together, and you only ever come together, for instance, once a year for a great piss up, then actually people feel less identity with the company than is good for them and good for the company. So what you're seeing at the moment really is a balance where companies are increasingly finding ways of allowing virtual working to happen, but they're still trying to keep the sense of identity, involvement, community, working as well as they can. For big global companies, of course, using IT these days to connect people up without putting them on planes, that's becoming a critical part of what's going on. Various estimates of how much CO2 has been saved as a consequence of this, and it's a reasonably good story. It's a reasonably good story. But my sense is we haven't begun to see where that evolution will take us in the long run. So I've just finished writing a book about 2050, what the world will look like in 2050. One of the questions that got asked immediately, are there going to be any multinational companies in 2050? Why should there be? It's not given. The global economy hasn't always had multinational companies. So maybe in 2050, the multinational companies have just evaporated away or been evaporated away because people get so cross with the pattern of multinational power. Who knows? Now, my take is we'll have fewer multinationals. They'll be much more localized, so they will all have local presences rather than great big national presences they do now. And they will all be infinitely more sustainable than they are today. Because otherwise, they won't get their license to operate from society, from their consumers, from their stakeholders. They won't have that license. So that's my bet. Some more radical types think we ought to get rid of multinational companies altogether. 
I'm not quite sure what that looks like, really. I think that's a little bit scary completely, because actually some of those big companies, they're doing a lot more than some of the governments in the world today. A lot more. There was a guy behind you. Was that? Yeah, there was another question there. Uh, you gave me the idea for the question. We used the word doable at the end. Uh, is it doable even, I think you said. Yes. Uh, that is uh, basically my question. This sustainability, is it doable? And um, does your forum have, do you engage in population debates? Do you have a view on population? What do you see happening in the doability uh, and population dimensions? What do you think? Do you think it's doable? A genuinely sustainable, just, good world for 9 billion people by 2050. Do you think that's doable? Do you think that? Well, if it's I'm 9 billion, perhaps. If it's 20 billion, I guess not. Yeah, okay. So that's a good challenge. So the projections are that the population will be around 9 billion people by 2050 and still rising. And the UN population division says that population should stabilize below 10 billion somewhere around the turn of this century. So that's why we talk about doing this for 9 billion people by 2050. Um, you asked whether the forum is involved in population issues, and the honest answer to that is no. Am I involved in population issues? Yes. Because I'm an old Green Party hack. I joined the Green Party in the mid-1970s. I've been passionate about population and campaigning for access to family planning for nearly 40 years now. I remain absolutely passionate about that campaign. And for me, I have to spell this out as simply as I can. The less we look after the issue of population, the harder it is to make it doable. So in the book, sorry, I'm just going to give you another example. In the book, the population of the world by 2050 is 8.6 billion, not 9 billion, because we've got brilliant about women's rights and family planning and reproductive health care and Bill Gates has done his stuff and Melinda Gates has done her stuff because she went to talk to the Pope and the Pope had a miraculous conversion in 2018 and he reversed 50 years of Catholic teaching about artificial contraception just after one meeting with Melinda Gates. That's all it takes in 2018. It's amazing. And at that point on, the Pope suddenly said, guess what, artificial contraception, bloody brilliant. Let's have more of it because frankly, we can look after everybody on planet Earth if there are no more unwanted pregnancies anywhere in the world, if every woman has the right to manage her own fertility everywhere in the world, 220 million women in the world today cannot do what most of us take for granted in our country, which is manage fertility in the way you want to. So I was dreaming a bit then. It was a kind of crazy moment. But I thought, well, why not? The Pope can have an epiphany. I mean, God speaks directly to the Pope. So why not? It's perfectly possible. So if you head towards 8.6 billion and population stabilizing below 9 billion by the end of the century, then we're on the right track. That's my part of the answer about doability. Part of the answer. OK, thank you. I'll keep my fingers crossed then. <laughs> it's a very bad form of contraception. But still. <laughs> Thank you very much. Jonathan, given that discussion just about hard choices, what balance do you think is needed between changing the culture of consumption versus the use of technology? Because probably at its worst, technology is almost seen as a panacea or a way of, you know, an easy solution. Yeah. What, what's your view? Because obviously, on the other hand, consumption is, you know, and the power of ownership is very strong in terms of social status. So although collab the collaborative economy looks exciting, you've also got this very entrenched culture of consumption to change. Yeah. So I'm absolutely certain in my own mind that we can't do this story about a sustainable world by 2050 without huge changes in technology, dematerializing, increased efficiency, decarbonizing 
So getting all the energy we need without putting all the emissions into the atmosphere, renewable energy basically, increased efficiency. We absolutely, there's no prospect of getting anywhere near a sustainable world without those very radical technology changes. But equally, if that's all we rely on, it's not going to be enough. It can't be enough. So we have to start thinking about the ways in which we change people's perception about what status means. What does aspiration mean? So I mentioned Zipcar very quickly. Um, so what do you think is going through the mind of BMW at the moment when they look at this very interesting chart in Germany where young graduates in Germany are less and less enthusiastic about the prospect of owning a BMW than they've ever been in the recent history of BMW. So it's always been part of what it is to succeed in Germany as a young graduate that you sort of think about what's my career path and how quickly can I get a, a BMW or a Mercedes, whatever it might be, it doesn't really matter, but how quickly do I get to that point on my status ladder? when I can not only live well, but I can have a car that tells people who I am. So BMW is watching this rather interesting little curve with a smaller percentage of young people saying, actually, I don't give a shit about owning a BMW. That's not what my life's about. I'm really not in for that stuff any longer. I, my status will be determined by different things. So a bit like Avis, you could either panic if you were BMW, as you saw your marketplace hollowed out by young people in Europe or America or anywhere else saying, don't want to do that. Then it would, of course, be all down to consumers in China to rescue BMW, just as they've rescued Jaguar Land Rover. It's great. Or if you're BMW, you say, OK, car clubs, that's interesting. Why don't we have BMW car clubs? Where the car you're sharing is a BMW. So you can have all the aspirational values attached with being a BMW driver, if that's your bag, by the way. I shouldn't really be using this example because it's so unexciting to me. But anyway, just imagine you're one of those people excited by sitting behind a wheel of a BMW, okay? You can have all of that, but you don't have to own the bloody thing. And in four German cities now, BMW set up its own car clubs. So the only car you can drive is a BMW. And they're going rather well. Now, BMW obviously hopes that young Germans will get so used to driving one, by the time they've got enough money to buy one, they'll go and buy one. My hunch is people say, that's brilliant. I only want to use this car for about... 20 minutes a week or two hours during the summer, whatever it might be, I'm going to go on staying in my BMW car club. So status, what does it mean? How do you express your success in the world today? How do we dematerialize the way in which people achieve status? That's the question. And Bill and I have a very, very jolly colleague who sits on the O2 advisory board together with myself called Solitaire Townsend, who's come up with this wonderful theory that you will never stop people trying to improve their status in society. That's kind of hardwired into people from an evolutionary point of view. It's just part of the deal. And the reason why, she argues, it's part of the deal is because through status, you get sex. And your status is the means by which you get an increased range of potential sexual partners. I tell you this is a bit provocative, but it's really rather interesting. So the idea is that you can't do away with the status because otherwise you'd be doing away with sex and that isn't gonna work for humankind. Good for the population story, but not really good for us in the long run. So her story is, okay, at the moment you only get status by buying things like BMWs. Again, a bit sad, but that's the sort of conventional theory. That's how we've grown the consumer economy. It's all to do with aspiration. What is that handbag story about? Let me shift the product here away from BMWs in case you think I'm getting at blokes. What is that story about handbags, for Christ's sake? Thousands and thousands of dollars on a thing that would work perfectly well if you had a brown bag in your hands. What's it about? So how do you change that around? Now, I guess women own a bag because they think it says something about them. I'm getting into some deep water here, which maybe increases the pool of potential sex your partners to make for a better life. So Solly Townsend's view is you can't do away status because status is inextricably connected to sex. And we're all, mostly all, interested in sex. So how do you dematerialize status? And her suggestion is we can do that through social media. 
and that people will increasingly express themselves, show who they are through their presence on different social media platforms. And we're already doing that, all this stuff about liking and approving and retweeting and doing all this kind of stuff. This is all a sort of early example that your status is to do with your presence on a set of virtual uh, networks. So you don't have to buy anything any longer. You just are brilliant on your social media. This is good for O2. Very good for the planet. Quite good for sex. Who knows? Maybe it's the answer. It's a rather long-winded way of saying we have to think quite deeply about the answers to that question. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any more questions in the audience? Hi. Thank you for your inspirational speech. Continuing with, uh, with the theme you, you are uh, speaking about now, yesterday I saw a, a comic of two kids sharing... Uh, there were two images. The first one is two kids sharing a toy and the parents applauding and saying very well. And the next picture is those two kids have grown up, and now they are two young boys sharing a CD or something, and now they are in jail. So the thing here is I th uh, maybe the thing we have to change, as you were talking about, sharing or these things, it may be the education. So yeah. are you doing at, the, at your organization something to, to change the perception of, uh, of sharing? Yeah. So how early in a child's life do we have to establish sharing behaviors rather than my behavior, me? And it won't surprise you to know that educationists and child psychologists have been working on this issue for decades to work out what it is that you would need to do to encourage and reinforce sharing behaviors at every point through a child's life, an infant's life, really, at so much so that by the time they got to the ages of 8 or 12 or 17 or whatever it might be, sharing is the norm. It's the pattern, the cultural behavior, which is seen to be the norm. And what we know is, of course, that very quickly, very young children take signals from their surrounding environment about the relative benefits of sharing versus the relative benefits of me first ownership, my toy, not yours, my toy. And those messages come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And anthropologists compare the way in which indigenous people bring up their children from day one, sharing everything all the time. There's just no boundary between that child, the next door child, the family, whatever it might be. And the way we bring up children, which is quite quickly to say, this is yours. Over here, don't touch that because that's not yours, but this is ours, etc., etc. Quite quickly, we inculcate patterns of individualized ownership which work against a culture of sharing. So this is a huge educational challenge. I was a teacher for 10 years in a secondary school, but I could tell you pretty much to the child which primary school they came from because of the way they behave when they got to secondary school. I taught for 10 years, and I'm not making that up, honestly, because you just sort of knew. And some primary schools were really just brilliant about, about promoting, sharing, collaborative learning. Everything was done together. Every sort of child was standing up for every other child. It was just amazing. And some other primary schools, it was, it was a, a jungle. It was a kind of me versus them story that meant by the time they got to secondary school, they were locked into them against the world. So you have to intervene very, very, very early to get normative responses to the culture of sharing. Absolutely. Don't be discouraged by that, though. Because, you know, even BMW drivers can do a little bit of sharing on the margins. Okay, we can still get a bit of that. Would anybody else would like to ask a question? Thank you very much, Jonathan. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. I'm sure you're leaving us all with a lot of information to think about. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Thank you all for being a part of this wonderful session. 
You're really welcome to stay for the next one, starting at 3 o'clock, which will be on the next phase of integrating technology into education. Thank you.
Please welcome on stage Frank Mihan, our next guest today.